I've just touched on a critical insight about fear, and it is important to go into it a bit deeper. That insight is this. If everybody has fear when approaching something totally new in their life, yet so many are out there doing it despite the fear, then we must conclude that fear is not the problem. Obviously, the real issue has nothing to do with the fear itself, but rather how we hold the fear. Some hold fear from a position of power, energy, and excitement, and some hold it from a position of pain, paralysis, and depression. The secret of handling fear is to move yourself from a position of pain to a position of power. The fact that you have the fear then becomes irrelevant. Before going any further, let's talk about the word power. I've had a few people tell me that they don't like the concept of power and want no part of it. It is true that in our society the word power has some negative overtones. It often implies control over others and unfortunately is often misused. The kind of power I'm talking about is entirely different. In fact, it makes us feel less manipulative of those around us and certainly more loving. I'm talking about power within the self. This means power over our perceptions of the world, power over how we react to situations in our lives, power to do what is necessary for our own self-growth, power to create joy and satisfaction in our lives, power to act, and power to love. The truth is that love and power go together. With power, one can really begin to open up the heart. With no power, love is distorted. A good antidote to your possible inner conflict about power and love is to repeat to yourself at least 10 times each morning, noon, and night these three affirmations. I am powerful and I am loving. I am powerful and I am loved. And my very favorite, I am powerful and I love it. Say these three statements aloud right now and feel the energy that the words convey. I am powerful and I am loving. I am powerful and I am loved. I am powerful and I love it. Their constant repetition will help make the concepts of power and love more compatible and certainly more comfortable. Now that I've explained the kind of power I am talking about, let's explore how we can actually get in touch with that part of ourselves that is powerful and loving and knows there is nothing to fear. To help you move yourself from a position of pain to one of power about fear, I want you to answer the following questions as honestly as you can. Do you see yourself as a victim? Or are you taking responsibility for what happens to you in life? The idea of self-responsibility is probably not new to you. For years, you've been bombarded with the message, take responsibility for your own life. So many of us think we are taking responsibility, but I'm convinced that most of us do not really understand what that means. To most of us, it has to do with daily survival. This may be part of it, but it certainly doesn't hit the heart of the issue. For example, Edward is an extremely wealthy, high-powered executive who lives in a constant state of anxiety. When I suggested that he go for some professional help, he responded that if the people in his life would change, everything would be fine. If only his wife would be more loving, if only his boss wasn't always on his case, and if only his son would stop taking drugs, then he'd be fine. He feels there's no reason for him to go for help, it's all their fault. Is he taking responsibility for his experience of life? Absolutely not. I know many people who are constantly complaining about how other people or situations are ruining their lives. Are any of them really taking responsibility for their experience of life? No way. They are all, in some way, playing the role of the victim. They have all given away their power to someone or something else. Keep in mind that when we give away our power, we move ourselves into a position of pain and paralysis when it comes to fear. The truth is, you really are in control, in total control of your reaction to whatever happens to you in life. I know it is very difficult to accept that we are the cause of the feelings that take away our joy in life. 
It is very upsetting when we begin to see ourselves as our own worst enemy. On the other hand, this realization is our biggest blessing. If we know we can create our own misery, it stands to reason that we can also create our own joy. Since really taking responsibility for your experience of life is an elusive concept, I will explain some of the components of a more powerful way of living. Just keep remembering that whenever you are not taking responsibility, you put yourself in a position of pain and hence decrease your ability to handle the fear in your life. So what does taking responsibility really mean? Taking responsibility means never blaming anyone else for anything you are being, doing, having, or feeling. I can just hear some of you saying, never? But this time it really is his fault, or her fault, or the boss's fault, or my son's fault, or the economy's fault, or my mother's fault, or my father's fault, or my friend's fault. Really it is. Now until you fully understand that you, and no one else, creates what goes on in your head, you will never be in control of your life. Taking responsibility means not blaming any outside force for your experience of life. When you do, you are literally giving away all your power and thus creating a situation of pain, paralysis, and depression. If something in your life isn't working, ask yourself, how can I change it? For example, if you're in an unsatisfying relationship, ask yourself, why have I stayed? Or look at your expectations. Am I expecting my mate to be doing something for me that I should be doing for myself? And so on. Look at all aspects of your life and ask what could you be doing to make it better. As an exercise, see if you can go one week without criticizing anyone or complaining about anything. You may have a very silent week. Griping is a habit and needs to be replaced by something more positive. This takes a bit of time and ingenuity, but it will be a far more satisfying and joyful way to go through life. What else does taking responsibility mean? Taking responsibility means not blaming yourself. I know this sounds contradictory, but it is not. Anything that takes away your power or your pleasure makes you a victim. Don't make yourself a victim of yourself. This again is not taking responsibility for your experience of life. It is important to understand that you have always done the best that you possibly could given the person you were at any point in time. Now that you are learning a new way of thinking, you can begin to perceive things differently and possibly change many of your actions and reactions. It is all simply part of the learning process, the process of moving yourself from pain to power, and it takes time. You must be patient with yourself. Taking responsibility means knowing where and when you are not taking responsibility so that you can eventually change it. It took me years before I realized that the place I played the victim role most was with the men in my life. I remember many evenings with my girlfriends complaining for countless hours about the grief the men in my life were causing me. Naturally, my loyal friends shared my drama, as I shared theirs. It was a moan and groan society at its best. The payoff was that we didn't have to create our own happiness. We could simply blame men for not giving it to us. I finally learned there is really only one person in the world who can make me happy or unhappy, and that is me. Ironically, only through this realization have I been able, for the first time in my life, to have a wonderfully nurturing relationship. Relationship with another is only one area where you can give away your power. It is important to look at all the areas of your life as well to determine where you are not taking responsibility. Your clue will be any one of the following signs. Anger, upset, blaming others, pain, vengeance, self-pity, envy, helplessness, impatience, joylessness, fatigue, addictions, a judgmental attitude, disappointment, jealousy, and so on. Have you ever felt any of these emotions? Well, whenever you do, figure out what you are not doing in your life that is causing you to feel that way. You will be surprised at how easy it is to locate where you are abdicating responsibility. 
Taking responsibility means handling your biggest enemy, your chatterbox. This is the little voice inside each and every one of us, the voice that tries to drive us crazy and often succeeds. I'll bet some of you don't even know it's there, but I promise you it holds the key to all your fears. It's the voice that heralds doom, lack, and losing. We are so used to its presence, we often don't even notice it is talking to us. If you are not aware of your chatterbox, it sounds something like this. If I call him, maybe he'll think I'm too pushy. But maybe if I don't call him, he'll think I'm not interested. But if I call him and his answering machine is on, I'll wonder where he is, and it'll ruin my whole evening because I'll know he's out with another woman. But if I don't call, I'll wonder anyway. Maybe I shouldn't go out tonight. He might call, and then he'll think I'm out with someone else, and he'll think I don't care. I wonder why he hasn't called yet. Maybe I was too cool today when I bumped into him at lunch. Maybe I should have been more friendly. I wish I were wearing something prettier. I, I look so fat in this dress. Oh, my makeup oh, it was terrible. He did seem a little cool, I'm sure of it. I wonder if it was because he heard I went out with Alan the other night. Well, I don't think he should expect me to sit home every night and wait for him to call. He has a lot of nerve if he expects that. Okay, the next time I see him, I'll ask him why he hasn't called. We were supposed to go to the movies this week and he didn't even remember. I'm going to confront him about his lack of responsibility. I mean, I won't be judgmental or anything, but I'll certainly let him know how I feel about his attitude. I mean, how can he expect me to still be friendly with him when I don't know when he's going to call or not? No wonder so many of us hate being alone and can't be in a room without turning on the radio or television for company. Anything to escape such insanity. Be assured that this insanity seems to be an unavoidable phase in the growth process. We are all victims of our own chatterboxes at some point in our lives. Now that you know it exists, you will also notice that you can't seem to turn it off, at least not yet. The good news is that there are very effective ways to get rid of this kind of negativity. Right now, commit to replacing your chatterbox with a loving voice. You don't have to hang out with enemies, even if they are within yourself. By the way, once we get rid of the negativity our chatterbox brings, we really begin to enjoy being alone. These are just a few of the many ways we can begin to take responsibility for our lives, and the time to begin is now. When you begin to notice how many times you blame outside forces, when you begin to notice how many times you blame yourself, and when you begin to hear the destructive messages you are given by your chatterbox, you will begin to understand why you have felt so powerless, so fearful, in facing many important situations in your life. I've just introduced you to your chatterbox, one of your biggest enemies when it comes to fear. The trick now is to replace it with a much more positive voice. And in our society, this is harder than you think. I was having dinner with a friend one evening, trying to make her see the positive side of something she fervently viewed as negative. She suddenly snapped at me. You're beginning to sound like Pollyanna. Much to my surprise, I snapped back. What's so terrible about Pollyanna? What's wrong with feeling good about life despite the obstacles that come your way? What's wrong with looking at the sun instead of gloom and doom? What's wrong with trying to see good in everything? Nothing is wrong with it, I said. In fact, why would anyone resist thinking that way? And resist we do. Positive thinking is one of the most difficult of all concepts to get across to people. When I present my ideas on positive thinking in my workshops and classes, my students respond immediately with, Oh, Susan, that's not realistic. When I question them about what makes negative thinking more realistic, they can't give me an answer. There is an automatic assumption that negative is realistic and positive is unrealistic. Upon inspection, this is pure madness. It is reported that over 90% of what we worry about never happens. If this is so, being positive is far more realistic than being negative. Being positive is also being more powerful. I learned an amazing demonstration of the effectiveness of positive versus negative thinking, which I now use in my workshops. I ask a student to come up and stand facing the rest of the class. After making sure she has no problems with her arms, I ask her to make a fist 
and extend her right arm out in front of her. I then tell her to resist my attempt to push her arm down with my hand. Usually I can't budge her arm. I then ask her to put her arm down, close her eyes, and ten times repeat out loud the negative statement, I am a weak and unworthy person. I then ask her to open her eyes and extend her arm again, exactly as she had the first time. Again, I remind her to resist as hard as she can. Immediately, I am able to bring down the arm. It is as though all strength has left her body. I wish I had a camera to capture the expression on her face as she finds it impossible to resist my pressure. I then ask her to once again close her eyes and repeat ten times the positive statement, I am a strong and worthy person. Once again, I ask her to extend her arm and resist my pressure. To her amazement and everyone else's, I cannot budge the arm. If I continue interspersing positive with negative, the same results occur. Weak words mean a weak arm. Strong words mean a strong arm. This is a stunning demonstration of the power of the words we speak. The amazing aspect of this experiment is that it doesn't matter if we believe the words or not. The mere uttering of them makes our subconscious mind believe them. It is as though the subconscious mind doesn't know what is true or false. It doesn't judge. It only reacts to the words it is fed. When the words, I am weak, come in, our subconscious mind instructs our body, intellect, and emotions, weak, 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 and we act as if we really are weak. And interestingly, the world treats us as if we are weak. People tend to walk all over us. When the words, I am strong, come in, the instruction to our body, intellect, and emotions is strong, strong, strong. And we act as if we are strong, and the world treats us with much more respect. What does all this tell you? Stop feeding yourself negative thoughts that take away your power and make you paralyzed with fear. But here you are, a blob of negativity. How do you even begin to turn around those miserable thoughts that take away your power? You begin by doing the same thing you would do if your body were out of shape. You create an exercise program, in this case, to retrain your mind. To do so, you must take action. It takes a special commitment and a great deal of practice to become a positive thinker. And once you get it all down perfectly, a maintenance program is a must. I know of no one who has been able to make positive a permanent way of thinking without practice. We must keep at it or the chatterbox takes over. Before giving you a plan of action, I recommend you get a few things to make your daily routine more efficient and pleasurable. 1. Purchase a small portable cassette player. 2. Pick up some inspirational and motivational tapes and books. 3. Fill up some index cards with positive quotes and affirmations. One of my favorite quotes comes from John Shedd. Ships in harbor are safe, but that's not what ships are built for. Put your quotes all over the place, on your mirrors, your desk, the refrigerator door, in your car, your diary, and so on. Do the same with your affirmations. What exactly is an affirmation? An affirmation is a positive statement that something is already happening. It's not happening tomorrow or in the future, but right now. For those of you who are not familiar with affirmations, I consider them one of the most powerful tools you have at your disposal. They are self-talk in its highest form. A few affirmations you might want to begin with are, I'm breaking through old patterns and moving forward with my life. I am now creating my perfect relationship. I am drawing to me all good things. My world is filled with abundance. I am creating a beautiful day. I relax and let go. I make a difference. There is plenty of time. These are just a few to get you started. There are some things to remember about affirmations. One, always state them in the present. I am now handling my fears, not 
I am going to handle my fears. Two, always phrase them in the positive rather than the negative. I am becoming more confident every day, not I am no longer putting myself down. Select affirmations that feel right to you at any given time. What feels right changes as your situation and mood changes.